Hello, Slush. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this very insightful discussion with three great investors. Uh, my name is Konrad. I lead our VC and LP relations. And here we have Amanda, Maciek, and Julia. Amanda, if you could start with introduction. Sure. I'm firstly just a huge, huge thank you specifically to Conrad, but to the entire incredible Slush team. It's just such an honor to be here, and you guys have put on the most exceptional show experience for, for everyone, so thank you. Uh, I'm Amanda Herson. I'm a GP at Founder Collective. We're a pre-seed seed fund uh, based out of New York and Boston. We invest globally. Um, we obviously believe in small funds, which is what we'll be talking about today. We're all founders and operators, and really we've built the fund to dilute alongside our founder um, and to really be aligned with them. And I think, you know, uh, we really thought deeply in building our fund, we're generalists about how do we sit on the same side of the table as the founder and, you know, really empathize with the founder who we're investing alongside. Thank you. Magic. Hello, guys. It's uh, such an honor to be here. It's my fifth slash, actually. Um, being here for the first time in 2019. Um, it's my favorite conference of the year. Uh, so I'm Matek, one of the general partners at Credo Ventures. We invest in founders coming from Central and Eastern Europe, um, starting their companies all around the world. Uh, we're also a small fund, 75 million um, euros under management in our fund four. Uh, we've actually decreased uh, uh, assets uh, from the 100 million that uh, we've been deploying from our fund three. And that is um, a story that uh, I'd like to cover here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matek. Julia? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you also so much for everything in terms of inviting us here to Slush. It's been absolutely amazing so far. Um, I'm Julia. I'm a general partner at Local Globe and Latitude. Um, it's a, Local Globe is a pre-seed and seed fund. It's $200 million for investing from Local Globe 12. Um, we also have a breakout fund called Latitude uh, and a crossover fund called Solar. I've been with the fund for seven years and yet yeah, delighted to engage in this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introductions. And since Slush is a founder-focused event, we have 5,500 uh, founders and operators, why don't we start with focusing on them? So you all three represent three different funds. What should founders know when speaking with a fund of your profile? Maybe uh, Amanda again. Sure. So, you know, I think there, there's a lot. Being a founder is one of the hardest jobs in the world. Um, and I think what founders should know is really think about alignment with your founder. And I think, you know, as, as a founder, the number one rule, don't run out of money. But I also think being careful about where you take money is really important. And thinking about what are the incentives of your investor, because once you take that first check, you're married. In fact, it's like worse than being married. Like you're married, there's money involved, you're stuck with them, it's not really easy to get divorced and they can really determine your destiny. And for the investor, we get to invest, you know, we have lots of companies in our portfolio. As the founder, you've got all your eggs in one basket. And I think making sure that you trust, understand the incentives of your investor is one of the most important things that founders are often like, oh, a VC gave me money, I should take it. And I think, you know, do they have the same time horizon as you? Do they have the same expectation outcomes? For some funds, you know, it's go broke or go bust. Uh, you know, we're a small fund. For us, we want every company we look at to potentially be a fund returner, but that doesn't mean you have to be a billion dollar exit. And, you know, some, you might, have aspirations to build a $20 million company, or you might have aspirations to build a billion dollar company. And I think ensuring early on um, that you think about who your, you know, who your investors are is incredibly important for the long journey. Wow, very insightful. Amachik, anything, anything to add to that? Definitely aligning incentives is, uh, is crucial, I guess, and understanding what your investors are looking for. Um, is, is one of the first things I try to uh, establish. I guess I, I'd reverse the question and tell uh, what founders cannot count on from us. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a small fund, so it's uh, basically a super flat structure. We have four equal general partners. Uh, we don't have a platform team. We don't have talent partners. We don't have <laughs> the support function. 
Um, we basically do all the heavy lifting uh, with the founders. Like we work together. Um, we help to source customer, uh, customers sometimes. We help to source um, uh, candidates uh, who might join the teams. Uh, obviously, that kind of uh, comes with limitations, right? Like we are a small team for partners, so we can't do any everything. Um, but definitely um, a, a very direct relationship with uh, a lead investor on our team is something that, uh, that we try to foster and try to uh, kind of tell the founders that, hey, like, we won't promise anything. Um, the best thing you can do is to call our founders um, for a reference, um, you know, ask them the question. Like, we never kind of try to oversell. Um, but definitely, you know, the first thing we do is, like, we set up a WhatsApp channel. We try to kind of, you know, be with the founders in the trenches. And that kind of generates serendipitous uh, <laughs> kind of things, right? Like, um, definitely introductions and, and stuff, but, like, you never know what a day brings. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, a, a very vague answer, but, like, we, we basically like to work with the founders very closely, like very personal relationship, no platform, no support function, like external support function. Right. Uh, that's kind of our approach. Julia, and how is it at local level? Do you have a, do you have a platform or is it also a few partners working directly with, with founders? Yes, I mean, at Local Globe, we, we do have, we have a 27 person team. So on the investment team, there are 12 of us. Um, we also have a platform person. We have a talent lead, a set, and, um, and also obviously legal and finance. Um, but I would say one thing that founders can expect when they come to us is that every single investor that they speak to uh, has check writing capability. And, and we support individual conviction. So we support each other on the, create small groups so that that lead investor can come to a recommendation. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I think separates us. So don't expect an IC. We don't have a formal IC where you meet uh, a whole, all of the investment team. Um, we act, that was something that we introduced in COVID. And, and actually, we realized that it was, wasn't a great founder experience to have an IC, and so that's why that's remained. Um, <laughs> um, oh, unexpected. <laughs> unexpected, and um, and yeah, and I would and I would say that ag again at Local Glow, we we also look for fund returners. So the most ambitious founders, uh, and we're very aligned on the upside. It means that we want to continue backing you and working with you all that way. Um, and, um, and yet also very nimble in terms of support and that your main point of contact will continue to be the investment partner that, um, that you've built the first relationship with. So how does it differ actually for, for the founders, right? Here we have a platform in, at Adara Fund we, we don't have. So does it mean that founders can have better relationships with, with, with general partners, closer ones? If there is no platform, what would be your take? I, I guess like I, I can start. Um, so it really depends from from like you know the founders should ask themselves a question, uh, and I'm not saying that our approach is the best, right? Um, that is basically at the end of the day what we want to do. Uh, we we've decided uh, some time ago that we as investors are not managers. We cannot manage an organization. We cannot manage like a, a big franchise. Like we cannot manage all the support kind of functions within our team. Like, that's not our um, core skill. Uh, what we like to think that we can do is uh, identify companies, like potentially winning, winning companies. Um, and that is basically what we've decided that we want to put like 100% of our focus on. Um, so, so if there's a founder who basically prefers, um, you know, working with several kind of experts, right? Because like platforms uh, consist, usually consist of experts. Like there's going to be uh, a talent partner definitely better equipped than us <laughs> to source great candidates, right? There's going to be a marketing expert, uh, expert definitely better equipped to um, advise on a top of the funnel um, kind of generation than, than we will ever advise, right? So if there's a founder who actually needs that function around him that goes along uh, with a, a partner who decides to bug the, the, that person, that team, sit on the board and work with the founder, 
absolutely. Like, uh, you know, that's a different approach um, that, that we've just realized internally at Credo that we cannot, cannot kind of provide the best experience. So we've basically given up on that uh, and decided to work hand in hand with, with the founders. Like, and, and we are looking for private individuals who, who would rather have that kind of a relationship. Right. Thank you. Amanda, on to you. How do you work with founders? Is it mostly general partners or do you have uh, experts at that founder collective? Sure. So I'm like listening to you and I'm like nodding my head because we also are four partners. We also believe strongly like you get, you get the GP and you know, I think what happens with platform teams is the best founders generally don't need platform teams to be very transparent. And I think what we really are is we, we have a term at Founder Collective, like, we're your favorite uncle. Like, some people are going to want to talk to us every week and just check in. Some are going to want to speak to us once a year when they need to borrow some money. But I think actually really where we believe we add value is on the more you're in the weeds every day as a founder, you're worrying about like every small detail. And I think we want to make sure that we can kind of bring you up and like look strategically, more holistically at your business and push you and challenge you. So we, you know, we've all built our own companies. We're all operators and builders. And I think what, that's also what, where we feel comfortable being generalists is, you know, our talent, if we had a talent team, they might be good at one vertical, but not at the other. We're not going to be the expert at your business, but there are business building principles. So for example, like most of my founders, when they're getting to series A, you know, their biggest struggle is hiring a head of sales. We've now seen that over and over. So we'll actually sit with them and sometimes we'll bring in a coach or someone external in our network. And I think we also believe very strongly that like our network is our net worth and we bring in people where needed. So, you know, I, I joke about it with my team, but like we're basically glorified human dot connectors and that's what we're doing all day. And rarely is the GP going to be the expert in that one thing you're trying to solve. But if they can get you to the right person, that's really the value they add. And I think, you know, with a very huge distributed platform team, that almost becomes, we obviously believe this because we don't have one. Um, but, you know, I think when you've got a very distributed platform team and people are coming and going all the time, it, uh, we question if it does actually add that much value and we push back on, you know, we, we structurally can't do it as a small fund, but we also wonder like how valuable it is to founders. Right. So general partners platform, it is all consequence on the, of the fund model, right? So the, the size of it, how do you navigate the, the fund model, fund size? Uh, maybe Julia, we can, we can start with you. Yeah, absolutely. I think from Local Glow, we've always remained very disciplined on fund size. And, and I guess my, my bet is that Local Glow will never change in that sense. I think it's always going to be a pre-seed and seed fund. Uh, it will be roughly $200 million uh, and looking for fund returners. The way that we've thought about Latitude and Solar is just that when we have built up a track record and of companies that are now growing to that stage and getting, it's basically it enables us to continue to stay close and partner with those founders. So, you know, selfishly, I, I love that. I love, I love the fact that you can lead around from Local Globe, you can help them get to an amazing Series A and be completely aligned with the founder on that as the next milestone. When they raise their B, you have an opportunity to invest alongside another investor that's leading that round. So we will never lead the Series B. And the same, if, once you get to pre-IPO, you can continue to back that founder. So. Like I, I really like this model because it just in, it aligns this conviction and partnership, which are you know fundamental values that, that we all share with, with the founders that we back. So it's a, it's a function of those those things. Right, and then you, Amanda and Magic, you have well significantly different model sizes, right? So seventy five, seventy five million. Ninety five, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So. What's the, what's the difference? 95, 75, 200? Why, why those numbers? That's a very good question. Um, you know, I think we think about, we almost like kind of think backwards from portfolio construction as well. I think that's part of it. And I think we look forward, to, so we, we have a dual strategy where we 
write both what we call angel checks, which is slightly smaller checks, and then we lead. Um, and you know, from a fund construction perspective, you kind of want to have enough shots on goal. Also depends how many GPs there are, um, all those types of things. But I think also, you know, in at Founder Collective, um, we believe quite strongly that we're not in this business for the management fees, we're in this business for, for the fund returns. And staying small is truly the only way to do that. You know, we've been fortunate to have a very successful fund one where many of our peers were smaller than us and have raised, you know, really large funds. And it, it's difficult to stay small. You've got to say no to a lot. Um, so I think that's one thing. I think the other most important thing is that we think staying small is the only way we stay aligned with our founders. Because every single 100%. check we write matters. Every single investment we make can return the fund. And we can't write off companies. We can't say, well, you're not going to return the fund, so good luck to you. I think we really want to kind of try to extract value from every founder. I would say the last thing I'd say is actually, as a small fund, our biggest constraint is the time of the GP. Mm -hmm. So that's also how we think about how many checks at what size can we write and still function as human beings and provide a minimum of service level for our founders. Um, so, so that's a key part also of how we think of like fund construction, how many checks. So it's quite, it's definitely, you know, an art and not a science. Um, and then I think we do a lot of data analysis, retro, you know, reflection on kind of prior funds, what, what's worked, what hasn't. Inflation is now in the US, which there wasn't a long time ago. So we've just slightly kind of tweaked up for inflation. Okay. And building on the last point that you mentioned about the, about the time magic, a question to you. So as you mentioned, four partners, no platform, and um, board as well. How do you navigate that, um, that, that time uh, constraint? So, so, so I would love to um, uh, talk about one thing. I think, Yamada, you've, you've hit a nail uh, saying about the alignment uh, of, of interest. We talk about alignment a lot. Um, you know, aligning the interests of LPs, our investors, who we take money from, um, the founders, and us in the, mean, in the middle is, is crucial, I think. Um, so actually, um, you know, th that's kind of true that the, the, the smaller the fund size, the easier it is to return it well, right? Mm. So then you're kind of playing the, the, the very transparent game with, uh, with, with LPs that, hey, like, we probably cannot pay ourselves huge salaries, um, definitely not a level of multi-stage kind of asset managers. Um, but, but we are here with you and with the founders uh, to actually generate like, great returns, like great multiples on the amount of capital that you give us to, to, to manage and deploy. Um, and that is where I think like, the, the, the asset consolidators, like big multi-stage funds that go after huge AUMs, um, kind of, you know, I'm not saying that that model doesn't work, maybe for some it does, um, but, but that's where I feel that alignment kind of disappears, right? Like, the, the, the GPs are incentivized to, to, to kind of stay with the firm, so probably they are slightly less risk averse. They don't want to do controversial um, bets. They don't want to go against the current, um, just to kind of stick to, 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 you know, the very comfortable position. Uh, whereas for smaller funds, probably taking risk is the only way to actually generate great returns, right? And okay. probably um, uh, the, the, that, that kind of works well for both the founders and LPs and GPs, if they're lucky uh, in the process, like they can actually make some money along the way. Um, so uh, answering your question, <laughs> <laughs> how it actually, um, how it actually uh, kind of works for us, um, so, so it, it works quite well. Like, I mean, we are a team of four GPs. Um, we, we are fairly independent. So um, like lone wolves, wolves uh, you, know, you know, managing their own portfolios. We do have, um, um, you know, internal meetings, one-on-ones, like we kind of work together. Uh, but every investor um, kind of decides for themselves what's their capacity. Uh, every decides, um, again, double-clicking to what you, Amanda, said, uh, what amount of portfolio, like active portfolio companies we can uh, onboard, how many kind of uh, companies we, um, we can sustainably help uh, and work with. Um, and uh, yeah, sure, like, you know, we have to do 
quite a lot of heavy lifting, and that's uh, definitely um, a part of it. But um, at, the, at the end of the day, it kind of, again, talking about alignment of in incentives, like it helps us to stay, um, stay very disciplined. It helps us to think about it in a way that, hey, if I partner up with that team, um, will I actually have what it takes in me to help them when things don't go well? Uh, will I have the time, will I have the wheel to actually spend time with those founders? Um, and that probably kind of, you know, also translates into uh, whether we want to make like FOMO deals, like do we want to just write FOMO checks? Do we want to decide, you know, after the, the, like live on the call or in the meeting, uh, because the round's apparently hot and like they have 10 other term sheets. And for us, because of the model, the answer usually is no. Like we would not commit. We would not get FOMO'd. Because for us, coming back to your question of the model, um, you know, we have like five, six, seven portfolios per fund and uh, portfolio companies per fund. And we want to make sure that every single one of them we actually believe in. We actually want to build a great partnership with that particular founder and we want to be there with them. So actually like small funds kind of put on, put some constraints on us that we actually like. Okay, interesting. And Julia, talking about the future, do you think that there will be more smaller funds or there will be a rise in the number of capital agglomerators? So, yes, the question is about the future artisanal funds versus capital agglomerators. What's the, what's the trend that you see? Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously feel that there, are, there is a lot of capital that's going towards these very small and constrained funds that are very aligned uh, with founders on building enormous companies that are aligned on the upside. Um, that are really targeting the fund returner type outcome. Um, and I, I mean, even smaller funds than that. So for example, we work with many emerging managers that have micro funds, and they are also phenomenal for us to work with because they are, they're great at even finding founders, sometimes even before we do, and we, we often partner with them. I think on the, on the point with regards to our, do we, will we see a bifurcation in terms of the fund model between these, I guess, the artisanal model versus the, the multi-stage funds. Um, of, I think the, the LP, the, L, the, L, the outcome for, for LPs may be slightly different in terms of what they receive in terms of from, from one versus the other. But, um, but obviously there are huge pools of capital that have different incentives in terms of where they, where they will be placed. And so I think we'll see a continuation and, and, and continued uh, innovation around the fund model, um, specifically to support different types of companies. Um, I also even think that there are fun, funds that are doing really well that are in between these two, that aren't, that they're not, uh, they're, they're not multi-stage funds, they aren't these very small funds, they're in between and they actually do really well. They may be more specialized and they may be more even, either stage focused or, uh, or sector focused. Um, and I think there are, they, they also play an enormous value in terms of supporting companies through the stages. Okay, very interesting. And now, shifting the gears from the future to maybe geographical focus, where here we have uh, American fund, CE fund, and, well, UK heavy fund. So, do you think that geography really influences your, your fund model, your fund approach, your fund strategy? Amanda. Look, I think the US has gotten incredibly competitive. I think we probably face the greatest competition from multi-stage, who are super active in the US. And I think it's really kind of driven us to focus even more on being artisanal. So, you know, a lot of the big funds now are building massive AI models and outbound, and that's not the game that we're gonna play. And I think figuring out where, um, we love working with people, we love working with founders, and I, I still think there's gonna be space for that. So, you know, I think one thing that is happening in the US, and Julie alluded to this, but is like going even earlier, really getting to founders like at inception. I think that's something that I think in general VC in the US has moved to kind of earlier seed. Um, I think in the US we spend a lot of, I spend a lot of time with founders trying to tell them not to take money because I think there's a little bit too much capital and heat in the system and we really believe in building capital and efficient businesses with intrinsic value. Um, 
I know I've spoken to some European founders here. I, I think it's a little bit harder to raise in Europe, and I, um, I'm generalizing here, and I'd love to kind of hear your viewpoints here. So, you know, I, I think in the US, being even more cautious about who you take from is important. And I think in the US, it could be more of a bifurcation of really small artisanal and then kind of huge multi-stage. Uh, but it's definitely interesting times in the US. I also would say that, you know, something we're seeing in the US is there was just this boom of funds during COVID. I'm not sure all of them are going to raise second time funds. I think we are going to see a little bit of a flushing of the system. I think it will be good for the system. I think it will be good for founders. Um, and, you know, the, the next few years will definitely be interesting. And we've got to just stay paranoid because it, it's definitely competitive out there. <laughs> yep. uh, so, so for us, um, the geography that, that we're focused on definitely had a massive impact on, on, on some of our decisions. So for context, our first fund um, was like 10-ish million uh, euros, like this, as usual, first fund, very small. Uh, the second fund was 50, the third one was 100. And we've been fortunate enough that our second fund was uh, very successful. So uh, we've made a lot of people very happy. So we had kind of a decision to make, All right? So we've returned some money, like DPI, and do we go the, the, the kind of you know, consolidation way and do we go up 250 to follow the logic or do we stay at roughly 100 million or do we actually go down? So we've done, we've done, a, um, we've done a, quite a lot of thinking uh, about like, what Central and Eastern Europe as a region has historically delivered um, in terms of you know, paper returns as well as proper DPI. So like all the exits, IPOs uh, with Eastern European founders globally. Um, and the answer uh, was actually less optimistic than we would have hoped for. Um, so it's basically those humongous outcomes that do make a difference for a fund are actually very rare in our part of the world. So, um, you know, we've basically realized that raising a, a bigger fund is like playing a Russian roulette. I mean, we can be, we can be lucky, like right? we can kind of score a great outcome um, and then hope for the best. Like, how likely is it? Like, how actually how likely is it? So, uh, so we've realized that the only feasible uh, scenario for us that we could build conviction in, and by the way, we invested uh, quite a lot, uh, quite a big part of the fund um, size ourselves. So, um, you know, uh, like we, we've definitely put our uh, money where our uh, mouth is. So, um, so yeah, like we basically did not believe that we could realistically return a massive fund following the strategy that, we, that we've been following. And we realized that like, us following that strategy is actually differentiated, actually can uh, provide um, you know, some alpha uh, over the market. So, so yeah, that was kind of the, the, the rationale. Right. And Julia, correct me if I'm wrong, but majority of your portfolio is in the UK, right? The majority is in the UK, but we actually believe in this region that we call New, New Palo Alto. So it's a, a five-hour train ride from our front door in King's Cross. That's where we spend most of our time, and, and that's where we think is, you know, outside of the Bay Area, the, the second most uh, attractive place to build unicorns. And I think, you know, exactly as you said, Amanda, we're absolutely paranoid. We want to remain number one in terms of um, backing unicorns at seed. And so f for us, I think, yeah, being geographically focused and having that constraint um, also enables the team to focus. We, we will participate in rounds uh, outside of that geography, especially if there's a strong local lead. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's how we, how we think about geography. Okay, very interesting. And maybe one last question because we, we only have a minute. So what do you think is your biggest differentiator as a fund, Amanda, in, uh, in a few words? No, uh, I mean, I think it really is. Everyone says they're founder friendly. We are structurally, I feel like we're twins here, but we're structurally founder aligned. We're our largest LP, we're aligned with our LPs and we're aligned with our founders. And I think it's very difficult to do. And I, we also intentionally don't follow on because we dilute alongside our founder and we think that also creates alignment. So I'd say alignment for us is the number one. Maciek? I actually couldn't agree more, my twin. <laughs> no, okay. that's, that's, definitely, that's, that's definitely true for us as well. I mean, 
Uh, being Eastern European focused uh, allows us to probably generate some edge uh, and like background checking. So like having that context, like we know what companies in Poland that, that you guys have never heard of are actually successful, are actually have great engineering culture, have great go-to-market uh, kind of processes in place. So when we see certain founders uh, spinning out from those places, like from those companies that are not well-known, uh, kind of you know multi-billion-dollar outcomes listed on Nasdaq, we can actually kind of filter through those uh, little tiny noises that are very much region specific. So, Julia, are you aligned with Amanda and Matthew <laughs> on this answer? A hundred percent. Yeah, I think it's it's all about yeah the alignment with the founders and and building the conviction and having that partnership for for the long term. So, yeah, a hundred percent. Okay. Amazing. And I think the four of us are aligned that it's time to wrap up. <laughs> so thank you a lot uh, for listening to amazing three investors. Thank Have you. a good flash. Thank you, Conrad. Thank you, thank you Conrad. Hi.